Studying a show like Squid Games can teach us a lot about the psychology of conformity and how both the individual and the masses can be controlled through using both subtle and not so subtle tactics. It's a show about a group of individuals playing death games to earn some godly amount of money by being the last person standing in order to get another chance at life. But let's back up a little bit. Number 1. Choosing the right victim The squid organization generally targets and attracts very desperate people that have little money to their name, a troublesome past, or a criminal one, even a record of failures, and so on. Our protagonist, for instance, is a manipulative and ungrateful son with gambling problems and who is about to lose his daughter that is moving away with his ex-wife to America. This makes him the perfect victim. Desperation and vulnerability are key. Shady groups like the Squid Organization will go out of their way to target those types by learning about people with large medical bills, immigration problems, shark loans. Drug dealers would slither around support groups the same way Ponzi schemers would open shop near self-help seminars. Number 2. Making contact when desperation is at its peak. Now that they have a list of targets to seduce, they approach them until they have a low point. In this case of the protagonist, they laid low and contacted him after he dropped his daughter off. I don't doubt they did the same with others. Number 3. Directing them towards the promised land using the halo effect. To do this you need a prophet, in this case a false prophet, a little demon, who needs to be attractive at least in the eyes of the target. Cults use attractive women in what's called the practice of fishing, flirty fishing. Here the protagonist was approached by a very handsome man with the qualities of someone successful, elegantly dressed, charismatic, well maintained, a nice smile, around the age of the target. A sort of an ideal image of what the protagonist imagined his life would turn out. If they sent a hobo or this guy, the target would run away. Now the contact happens. The protagonist suspects that the man is a salesman or some kind of a religious recruiter. The guy asks him if he likes to play a game, then shows him what he is about to win. He ignores the skepticism and doesn't debate with the ideas, but shows him the upside. Number 4. Demonstrating through action, never through argument. And number 5. Creating temptation. With the temptation present, the offer is harder to ignore. Both players will go on to play a game that both of them are familiar with and to normal eyes seem like it's a game of chance. In addition to the nature of reward and punishment, people repeat actions that lead them to reward and avoid actions that lead them to punishment. Number 6. Using the contrast principle. In this case, the contrast between the lucrative nature of the reward and the easy nature of the punishment seduced the player to get hooked on the game. Because who wouldn't take money for a few harmless slaps? The protagonist has an addictive personality, which helps. He even lets him start first, giving him an advantage, knowing that he can leave if he wins immediately, lowering his guard down. They play numerous rounds and our guy wins a lot of money. He is super happy. The guy informs him that he can play a lot of games like this with even more rewards. There are two points here. The first point is 8. Asking people when they are happy is the best strategy because they make lavish promises and are more open to offers. Let's say you are working for a guy and you want to ask him about a raise or time off work. Befriend his driver or secretary beforehand and keep tabs on his mood. Only ask when the light is green. Remember that. The second point is, or number eight, using the foot in the door technique. You ask the person for a small favor because it's smaller and with minimum drawback, they are more likely to accept your following favor. By initially playing this harmless game, he placed his foot in the door and now can lead him to the promised land. Ben Franklin used to ask for small favors to build relationships with people that hate or dislike him. Even then, 
This doesn't work on the protagonist, since he's not as naive as the average person. If we know anything, is that the fear of loss is more intense than the promise of gain. So, number 10. Reminding them with the consequences. And so he reminds him of what he is about to lose. His dangerous contract with loan sharks. His potential loss of his daughter. He shuts the door on the potential of a miracle, happening by mentioning the record of the failure in the protagonist's life planting the seed that he will not change. And this is urgent. This is his only chance to rewrite the past. Also, number 11, demonstrating authority over another person's world creates the illusion that you know more than you do. The target will keep asking themselves what else do they know? Who else do they know? And what does that mean to me? Number 12, making yourself look bigger. People are easier to convince when the body language is assertive. Standing up as they sit down makes the perception of power a little bit tilted to your advantage. That is on an unconscious level. The protagonist realizes the seriousness of the situation and asks the recruiter how he knows all of this. The recruiter doesn't directly answer questions. This keeps his frame and creates an imbalance in the sense of power especially after exposing the other person's weakness in depth. Number 13. Using the scarcity principle. The recruiter tells him that they don't have many spots left, triggering a FOMO response, the fear of missing out on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We perceive rare things as more valuable. It's one of those reasons why specialists like doctors own way more money than other professions. It's the same reason why panic buying is a thing, with people hoarding large amounts of supplies in fear of something or some disaster. The scarcity doesn't have to be real. One that is based on a lie is just as effective. The false prophet now leaves him with a phone number. And by the end of the episode, our guy becomes contestant number 4065 in this bloody sport that is the Squid Games. It is worthy to note that a lot of hidden factors pushed towards this decision, such as cognitive biases like the illusion of luck, the illusion of control, the illusion of expertise, and optimism bias. People see themselves as the center of events. They are the main character. And what do we know about main characters? They are protected by plot armor, unless you are a Game of Thrones character. Well, this means that... I'm afraid I've got some bad news! <laughs> anyway, I might do another video on the subject, depending on the demand. So, if you guys like this video, watch one of these Game of Thrones breakdowns. And don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe. And most importantly, stay sharp.